Well, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Steve Adler. I'm director of the Ethics and Journalism Initiative here at NYU. And thank you for being here. Thanks to my students for being here. Thanks for everybody else for coming in. Really appreciate it. Um, before we start the event, I just want to tell those of you who don't know a little bit about the Ethics and Journalism Initiative. Uh, we launched this fall, and the idea was that we thought people needed more thinking and more guidance around ethics issues in journalism. It's especially urgent now, the AI issues that you're all dealing with, issues of what do you do in a political environment where so many people are lying and there's so much disinformation, and all the other standard issues. And when uh, really the idea came to me when I was teaching last fall, and it, it was obvious students were going off to reporting class and had so many questions that were gonna transcend what we could do in class. And it seemed to me all year round we should be thinking about journalism ethics, thinking about what leads to ethical journalism. And our goal, essentially, is to get people walking out of here becoming better journalists, think, having something that they take away from this that helps them do this work uh, more ethically and more effectively. I mean, to me, the heart of ethics is having humility about the fact that it's very difficult to ascertain what's really going on, and we don't always know. Um, to be transparent about what we do know and what we don't know and about our methods, um, and to do honest fact-finding, to whatever our political views are, to try to get at the facts in as straightforward and honest way as we can. So we're doing mentoring. Uh, we'll start doing one-on-one -on -one mentoring in the spring. We're doing workshops. We're doing a security workshop um, in, in a little while, uh, later uh, next month. And we're starting a website, uh, ethicsandjournalism.org, which is going to launch in January. And we'll have lots of resources. It'll have every ethics code from every major news organization um, and group like uh, Society of Professional Journalists and all other groups like that. Uh, it'll look at AI guidelines that various news organizations are creating. It'll provide articles and how-tos. So again, watch for that, ethicsandjournalism.org, starting sometimes in January. And Catherine Bengi is here, who has uh, designed it, and so we're very grateful for that. Um, our small team, we have a very small team, is here, so I do want to introduce them. Um, Karen Pincero is in the back. She's our senior advisor. She has just joined, and we're so happy to have you joining, uh, most recently managing editor at the Wall Street Journal. And we have Tricia Crimmins, who is a senior reporter at The Daily Dot and has been so helpful for this project. So happy to have you here. Our two grad students, unfortunately, are in class tonight. Uh, Maya Brown and Sabrina Solovitz, but they've been an enormous help uh, to the program as well. So thank you all for being here. We're gonna start with the politics panel, and let me introduce our excellent panelists. Uh, sitting next to me is Jay Rosen, and you probably know Jay, because Jay is a longtime professor here, and what happened to that second page of my notes? There we go. Um, and uh, he's a leading press critic, uh, author, blogger, longtime professor here. And he's director of Studio 20, which you may know about. It trains NYU students to plan, design, prototype, and launch innovative digital journalism products. So we're really happy to have Jay. Um, sitting next to Jay is Nancy Solomon. Nancy is a senior reporter, podcaster, and the founding managing editor of New Jersey Public Radio. And she's covered New Jersey politics for more than two decades and covering New Jersey politics is get get to some very interesting insights. So so we're really really happy to have Nancy and she's produced more than 100 stories for NPR so we're delighted to have her. And old friend Lydia Polgreen, so happy to have her. She's now an opinion columnist at the New York Times. Uh, previously she was a foreign correspondent there covering West Africa, South Asia and South Africa and she's former editor in chief of HuffPost where she dealt a lot of with a lot of these ethical issues that we're going to be talking about about today. Uh, we're hoping that Wesley Lowry will join us, but the, those we have are uh, going to be able to talk through these issues, I think, very, very effectively. Um, so I want to start out with the subject of horse race reporting. Uh, horse race reporting is something that I at least think plagues the landscape. Uh, every time there's an election afterwards, journalists say, no more horse race reporting, we're just going to cover the issues. Um, but everybody still comes back to the horse race reporting. And, and Jay has done a lot of work and a lot of, has uh, spoken out very forcefully on this issue. And um, you, know, you have the expression that's really taken hold, not the odds, but the stakes. And so I was wondering if you could talk to us first about uh, why is horse race reporting problematic? Uh, what do you mean by um, not the odds, but the stakes? And are there ways that journalists can 
move in that direction that they're not doing. Okay, thank you. Um, well, the, the important thing to understand about horse race journalism is is not that um, it's not it's not a problem that people are interested in the horse race, and it's not a problem that journalists um, keep track of polls and try and give good information about who's ahead. Um, the reason it becomes a problem in journalism is that the horse race is used as a central organizing principle for campaign coverage. And that's the part that I think is not optimal and ought to be changed. Uh, Wesley's here. That's good. Join us. Always making a dramatic entrance. Um, uh, I, I know this group can appreciate a, a call to edit that takes a little longer than you thought it was going to. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. We're really happy so. to have you. I've just introduced everybody. Good. Well, and you've we've met everyone who's worth knowing. No, no, we're. <laughs> Um, for, for those who don't know him, Wesley Lowry is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, best selling author, podcast host, and one of the nation's leading reporters on issues of race and justice. So thanks for being here. Thanks. So We're much talking about horse race reporting, and Jay, is, Jay has the floor. Okay, so a, a second point to understand about horse race um, journalism is that it's, it's a very formidable adversary. It's, it's got a lot of advantages that, that are the reason that you keep seeing that every four years, despite the fact that people say they're frustrated by it and we're gonna cover the issues, we're not gonna do the horse race, and they always wind up doing it anyway. And by the way, there are lots of empirical studies that show just how dominating the horse race is as a category of coverage. It is frequently the majority of the campaign coverage is about who's up, who's down, who's likely to win, who's not likely to win. So it's not, this is not a small problem, it's a very large problem. But among the advantages the horse race has are it's portable, it can move to almost every election. It, it's stable, you don't have to remember, you just do exactly what you did the last time and it works. Uh, it works for every level of politics from the presidential down to the school board. Right? Uh, and perhaps its greatest virtue from the point of view of traditional journalism is that who's gonna win, the central question of horse race reporting, is not itself an ideological question. Right? It's just an empirical question. And so by emphasizing who's gonna win, you are saying, you are, you are showing that you have no side, you have no ideology, you're, you're just a savvy reader of how the campaign is turning out. And that is pleasurable to a lot of journalists because it puts them between the candidates, which is where they want to be. Uh, and this is the reason that people every four years say, we're gonna get beyond the horse race and they don't. And the reason they don't is that the horse race is a organizing principle, not just an annoying habit. So do you have any recommendations if journalists want to get past the horse race? Well, this is why I, I, developed, I developed this little mantra of mine, not the odds, but the stakes, to show what alternatives there are to the horse race. And one of them is to show that the stakes of, the, of this election and what would happen if, uh, if this candidate won, what would likely happen if that candidate won, or would this party or that party, and, and making the first test, the organizing principle of campaign coverage, the stakes as opposed to the odds of candidates winning would be a kind of a seismic shift. So that's why I keep repeating this phrase. Yeah. Stephen, if I could just Catchy. jump yes, jump please. in for uh, for a second, I mean, I think one of the things that 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 I think is is really striking about about that formulation um, is is that is it it's the combination of the kind of I'm just here to call balls and strikes and 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 the and the horse race that's particularly pernicious and one of the things that's really per pernicious about it is that it actually doesn't even a good job do a good job of telling you what the odds are right yeah. um, I mean that's the irony I mean I can't tell you how many people have told me like oh my God Ron DeSantis like I knew that was never going to fly that guy was like just complete like you know, DOA, like you see him with voters, he can't talk to people, he was never gonna survive. And I'm like, wh why don't you write that? You know, like if that's actually what what's happening, right? Like, 
so 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 to me it's not just that the that the horse race um reporting itself is 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 toxic for democracy it's also that it actually doesn't even achieve the thing that you're trying to and i think one of the reasons it doesn't achieve the thing that you're trying to achieve which is like telling you what the odds are is because you're not being honest about what you're seeing you know you're 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 so devoted to this idea that you're just observing and the voters are going to decide da, 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 da. and i don't mean you you act like your head is full of cotton wool rather than actual brains and 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 like true observation of what you're seeing and that to me is like is like the most pernicious combination of all so, so it, what's what yeah. do you see as the uh, antidote to that i mean if, if you're at the new york times you know it'd be good if you commented on do you think the new york times does too much horse race reporting but if you feel comfortable doing that <laughs> but but also uh, well, again does whether she'll say it or not. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to wesley and he'll say it but but um you know, what can journalists in the room do if they don't want to do that? There's going to be a lot of pressure to do that. What should they be doing instead? Well, I mean, I think I think that there, there are just some like really simple virtues of journalism. And one of them is being plain spoken about what you're seeing, you know, and 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 noticing what are the sort of stuff. And I, I think there's a lot of copying that happens in journalism. And it and it just and I think what, what Jay was saying about this, this, you know, kind of portability and 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 plug and play nature of these types of stories like, you know, supporters of this person said this and this, you know, and, and there's there's this kind of there's this kind of uh, paint by numbers or or you know, sort of cut and paste way that these stories get put together. So just noticing what they are and and noticing that those patterns and I, you know I, I'm not it, like I read the coverage of the New York Times. I think you know like every news organization, it's got a wide range of lots of different kinds of coverage. And I think you know some of the reporting that's that that. Um, that, that the Times has been doing lately on what a second Trump administration might look like and really playing out if Trump did the things and, and the people around him did the things that they're going, they're saying they're going to do, what that would mean, I think has been really important and really salutary. But I think that, I think that like the, 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 the best thing that a reporter can do, and if I were a young reporter today, I would be going to my editor and saying, like, I just want to be able to write in a plain spoken way about what I'm actually seeing here, you know, and not not sort of gussy it up with language of like, you know, strategist said this. Blah, blah, blah. What are you seeing? Like what, you know, use your common sense and report what you're seeing out there on the field. Go and report. That's always the that's always it's not always the answer, but it's but it's often a very good and very strong yeah. first answer to solving any journalistic reporting well, problem. Is chomping at the bit, and then we'll get to Nancy. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I, 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 you know, show up late, interrupt everyone. Like I'm, I'm working on it, right? The, I, I will say that I was reading something. I was uh, reading something from I mean, maybe almost a decade and a half ago, and there was this wonky professor who had not yet come up with the f turn of phrase he's using now, but who was making these exact same arguments a long time ago. And so I think there's some value in, it is now in vogue to, to credit our, our, our colleague here with this new innovation he's just came up with, but has secretly been arguing for like 25 years and yeah. just no one was listening to him until this moment. Um, and so I-, I Well, it I, turns out the stakes are different now. Yeah, sure, fair <laughs> enough, right? Like, or, or the stakes feel different to people because- yeah, Exactly. These, these were the stakes, yeah. always, right? And, and um, and so he's getting his flowers at this moment. I think we should acknowledge that this is these are not thank in you. fact new arguments. Yeah, um, this is not a new idea. Um, and I think as we think about this, and, and I may and look, I, I may have missed this at the very beginning of Jay's introduction, but one of the key reasons I think that we continue doing this, right? And I is that, and I think one of the reasons sometimes we have a hard time talking through it collectively because the reality is we get into rooms like this and we all basically agree. <laughs> right. <laughs> Any person whose job is to talk about journalism and from a like principles journalistic way, like agrees on 87 percent of the things. And then we all fight about the 13 percent that we barely disagree on. But we put a comma in a different place and pretend we have these deep principle fights. We don't. Right. We all agree on most of it. The reason we don't fix this is because it is because we make money off of the horse race. It's the way we keep the lights on. I one of my least favorite things in the entire journalistic media landscape is election night. Now, why is that? Because you have the most biggest captivated audience of any night in the entire year, and what do, and what do our dear friends do with that audience? They shovel them bullshit for hours. 
there is nothing that Steve Kornacki, who I love, can tell me at 7 p.m. on election night that is worth knowing. Mm -hmm. The polls aren't closed yet. What could we do? We could go to Oregon where this ballot measure is on the ballot today and do the most thoughtful piece possible about what does it mean to decriminalize heroin in this place and what do people think about it and how to, no, 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 no. We're gonna go to a breaking news alert where Wolf Blitzer tells me that Wyoming is too close to call. Mm -hmm. Sure, the polls aren't closed. <laughs> also, also, news alert, Wyoming is never too close to C call. Correct, and by, and by the way, right. right? And let's zoom in to a county in Georgia where we have two of the four million votes. Yeah. It's yeah. literally journalistically useless. Yeah. Yeah. Why do we do it? Yeah. Because yeah. we sell yeah. horse race. It's yeah. the gamification of the, yeah. it's how we keep you on the channel. It's how we, you have to buy the New York Times tomorrow to know if yeah. DeSantis is up or down or how to, it's yeah. the financial model. And, right? and because we do agree about so many things, I do want to also think about what can journalists actually do about it or can they do nothing about it? Are we, are we gonna leave them saying you can't do anything about it? I wanna to move to Nancy before. So horse racing is a big sport in New Jersey. So, so, so tell us about you know, sort of your thoughts on, uh, based on all your time and experience, covering elections, covering Christie, covering all the things going on in New Jersey. I mean, how do you see this issue? I think it's changing a lot. I mean, I think that I don't have any disagreement with the idea that we shouldn't be doing horse race journalism. But I think the way the where the rubber really meets the road is, um, you know, I mean, I, I, as it's been said, I cover New Jersey, so I'm not covering a presidential race, but I am covering congressional races. And I can't get the Republicans to talk to me, period, nothing. Like they will not return my calls. They will not give me an interview. They try to shut me out of actual events. They hold events without announcing where it'll be so you can't actually follow the guy and go and see what he's saying on the campaign trail. So I kind of face like a whole other level of problems where the the divisions, like the, the Republicans don't want to talk to the public radio audience. And we do have a lot of Republican listeners. It's a mis, misconception, but they we're so divided at this point that to try to focus on the issues is is also very difficult for other reasons you know yeah. that it's just very hard it's it's become so tribal and uh and and the differences are so great that there's not a whole lot to of meat on that bone to pick over i mean i think we know where the republicans stand we know where the democrats stand and it's kind of there's not a lot of nuance there. Um, so I, I'm dealing with both of those things at the same time. And, and um, it, it's because it's very difficult to do any kind of real reporting about the two candidates in the race when one candidate yeah. is completely, uh, a, you know, AWOL. Yeah. I mean, people often talk about issues coverage as the, the thing they lament that we don't do enough of. And is it that People don't know how to report issues, stories, or are reporting them from too, too high a level, or are people just not that interested in the issues. And and how do you find? How do you think about um, what you're going to report that people are actually going to care about? What what is the way you find out? The um, Lentfest Institute has polled um, their the people in Philadelphia, asking them. They had a whole campaign asking them, you know, what do you care about? What do you care about most? And one of the things they cared about a lot was garbage collection, but nobody's covering garbage collection as part of the, the election. Should, should we be asking people what they want to hear about? Just, uh, just, just this whole issue, uh, which I struggle with a lot, of how do you get at the issues um, and get people to think about what actually is going to matter to them as part of this election? Any, anybody take that? Uh, well, I'll start off. Um, I've been speaking up for a model of campaign reporting that's quite old. It goes back to the 1990s before the internet. Uh, it's called the citizen's agenda style of campaign coverage. And it says you have to start in a different place if you want to get more substance into the campaign. Mm -hmm. And um, the recommendation is to start not with the candidates and their chances of winning, or even with the issues as the political class has already defined them, 
but instead start with a question for the people who you are serving. And the question is, what do you want the candidates to be talking about as they compete for votes? What do you want the candidates to be talking about as they compete for votes? And if you can ask that question in as many ways as possible, not to dozens, but to thousands of people, what happens is that there are patterns in the responses. And you, if you are an active listener, you can construct from what people tell you a kind of priority list, mm -hmm. the, which we give the corny name Citizens Agenda to, but you can call it anything you want. And that, if you are diligent in doing that, then you have some sense of what people want the campaign dialogue to be like. Yeah. And, yeah. and that agenda allows you to um, organize your coverage in a different way. Because now that you have this priority list, you have instructions for what to send your reporters out to dig into mm -hmm. in a background mm -hmm. way, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, you know what your voters guide at the end of the campaign should look like because yeah. you have these yeah. uh, priorities yeah. already sussed out. Yeah. Um, you know what questions to ask when you happen to get yeah. hold of the candidates. So I think it's, it's change at that level. You kind of like have to rebuild the machine from the ground up. Yeah. And just saying we want to talk about issues doesn't always um, do it because the issues sometimes are themselves formulated to um, alienate the other side. Yeah. You know? yeah. So that's yeah. that's where I am. On yeah. that no, interesting point. So uh, Lydia, in 2017, you engineered this 25 city Listen to America tour and basically saying you wanted to find out uh, what people cared about and then we incorporate that into reporting. How did that work? And did you find out things that would be useful if somebody was covering this campaign? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's so interesting. You know, I, I, there's so many things about that time period that that I reflect on now and, and, and think about, like, how you shape coverage, how you think about things. But I mean, before I get to that, I just want to I just want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, when I when I became editor in chief of HuffPost, I was taking over from Ariana Huffington, um, who is, you know, an extraordinary impresario, you know, person who's done so many fascinating, interesting things in their in, in her life. Um, but she had decided um, with the politics editor at the time, um, or the DC bureau chief at the time, Ryan Grimm, that they were going to put all of the Trump coverage in the entertainment yeah. section, right? Yeah. Uh, and it was, well. it was, you know, it was it, at the time and, and me being a sort of high minded reporter, you know, an editor from the from the hoity toity New York Times. I was, you know, like when I was taking this job, I was like, oh, you know, they'd already obviously changed it because he'd been elected president and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I was just sort of like, well, I would never have done that. And I don't you know, I don't. And the truth is, I probably would never have, I, I probably would never have done that. But. In the fullness of time, all these years later, I look back on that decision that they made, and I and I see it a lot more clearly and recognize it a lot more clearly. Um, and I I've thought about writing about this and may still yet, but um, it, what it was was a cry for help, right? It was a it was a way to try and say like we don't know what to do with this situation. This is insane. This is insane. You know, like how are we supposed to pretend like this is news and yeah. like like this is and, and like, once I sort of take off my like hoity-toity, like former New York Times editor hat and really thought about it, mm -hmm. I, I realized like, I, I, I don't think that they were necessarily wrong. And I was probably wrong to be so immediately dismissive of, of, of that decision. And I, I, I mentioned that just because it really speaks to like the, the, the incredibly difficult decisions that you have to make when you're particularly I mean during during those early you know Trump years as a person running a um, you know a digital news organization a lot of us were you know really struggling financially trying to figure out a path to become um, you know forget about profitable at least like lose like little enough money that you're the company that owns you if you're lucky enough not to still be you know pre-acquisition um, 
you know, keep, keep the lights on. Um, that's what you were constantly thinking about is like, how do I keep this going? And, you know, we were very lucky to be able to get the support to do this, this, this tour across, across the United States. And much like what, what Jay, we did a lot of the kind of work that Jay was talking about. You know, we, we went and we, we, we set up, we took a bus and we set up in, you know, kind of town squares and in cities across America. We were, didn't go through the coast. We tried to go to kind of smaller cities, regional hubs. And we just had so many amazing conversations. And we heard like, you know, what are the issues that people really, really want to um, really want to know about? And what are the issues that, that, that really matter to their communities? And, you know, the results of that were, were wouldn't surprise you. You know, people care a lot about health care. They care a lot about education. They're really worried about crime and, and gun violence. They're, you know, all of these types of issues. And at, at HuffPost, we covered the hell out of those issues. We took that agenda and we did like the best journalism that we possibly could. And I'll tell you what, it wasn't enough to keep us from having to do, and I'm sorry if this is depressing, having to do four, four rounds of layoffs in three years, right? And, um, and to face constant pressure from our corporate ownership um, why is traffic down? Why are we not, you know, yeah. and you end up, why, why are, you know, why are you not, um, you know, why do we not have this story fast enough? Why do we not have this? What can you match? You know, all of those kinds of conversations. And so I think that there is this really, really, really difficult problem at the heart of journalism right now that, you know, I think speaks to what, what Wesley was talking about. I mean, the reason that Steve Kornacki is, is, I mean, what he's doing is vamping, right? He's filling airtime. And, and and he's doing that because that is a hell of a lot cheaper than sending a reporter to Portland, Oregon and doing a fully reported package with a reporter, a producer, you know, um, uh, like a team that's going to go and actually do a high quality reported package is a big team. Yeah. Well, I mean, there is an entertainment element uh, of news and you have to acknowledge that. But by putting it in entertainment, um, what wasn't have Post or Huffington Post at the time, um, not doing exactly what you were doing, which is trying to figure out why the heck people were somewhat interested in this. Um, in this totally. Approach. And yeah. I'm not saying that I would have put it in the entertainment yeah. section. I just think that it was a stunt that was designed yeah. to try and draw attention to the fact yeah. that this was an absurd situation. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. let me just go to 2024. And I, I want to like stop it. Um, in 15 minutes so we can take questions yeah. because that's often the most productive part of these things. Um, but I do want to get to 2024 and I have bunches of questions about it. And again, trying to be as practical as possible. I mean, it's easy to say, you know, how could it's, it's such an outrage what's going on, but you're trying to cover it. And actually a lot of students are in reporting classes where, you know, they have a candidate they're, they're following in the Republican um, so-called race and it hasn't really started yet. Um, but what should, how should students be thinking about um, this election? And particularly, so you have a presidential candidate who is um, also under indictment for 91 felonies. Is he, do you treat him more like a, a felony, felony defendant? Do, do you simply treat him like a regular political candidate? Because the fact is he has tons of support and he might become president. How, how do you think about the duality of that? How do you cover things when somebody isn't telling the truth. Um, again, going forward, we, we've all had the debates um, in, in the past, but we are where we are, you know, in, in a very messed up uh, system where people aren't believing anything they're reading from somebody who doesn't agree with them. So if you're a journalist, how do you think about covering this particular uh, campaign? And anybody can take this on. <laughs> I'm so glad it's not my beat. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. You wouldn't cover it. No, but I, there's. I don't. As an individual journalist, is the question. Would, well, if how you would were, I, as a journalist? Well, right. I'm you sitting. Say, at let's the, say you're assigned. Right. Let's say you're assigned to cover um, the campaign, and you know you've read the books, you've read Boys on the Bus, you've read Chasing Hillary. Um, is there something you can do that's more constructive this time around? Or to we have uh, news executives read here. Read better books. Um, um, the, the, nothing yeah. in those books has anything to do with what we need to do in this moment. Okay. Um, and I think that um, because I think that we're in a moment where, uh, again, we've had this conversation and we always have this conversation 
the collective we, <laughs> not us specifically, but yeah. we all always have this conversation, right? Yeah. And the, the that election that part of the stakes, right, is not just it's not just rhetorical, right? It's not just writing this idea that this who are the people, right? Who are what is the story of the family who was who experienced the Muslim ban the last time is worried about what's going to happen next, right? right? And that is actually a far more interesting campaign story yeah. to me than anything that any one of these nonsensical people is saying right now, right? right. And so, but again, reading the boys on the bus isn't going to get you to that story yeah. idea. So it's from because, the ground, you're saying from the ground up, good, talking to people about what they're going to need from or, their political or leaders. using our critical yeah. thinking and saying, mm -hmm. knowing what the stakes are, yeah. Right. Knowing that in a world where this. So, for example, on my list of story ideas for the coming year, and if you all beat me to and have fun, you're not going to. Right. Is, you know, I've corresponded with years with a man named Billy Allen, who is on federal death row, who is very likely the next time a Republican president is elected, the next person to die. He will literally die if Donald Trump becomes president, or if Ron DeSantis does, or if Nikki Haley does, or like. And so the headline of the piece that I'll write eventually will be the next man to die. And it will be a look at death penalty politics and the conversations we have about how punitive our system will be and what actually rides in this decision. Not in these theoretical big ways and small ways will democracy die. Will Billy Allen die? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? And that is a story that's about stakes, that's real, that's about policy, that's about issues. Yeah. Theoretically, Ron DeSantis' name appears in it somewhere, right? Like, <laughs> but it's not, it doesn't involve me doing anything. I mean, at the campaigns and candidates have basically nothing to do yeah. with it. I know what their position is and now I'm, yeah. and so for me, I think in terms of journalism, <clears throat> that yeah, the problem becomes as both an individual journalist and as us collectively, right? As Lydia just noted, and as we know, I, I've never forgotten this. When my friend Mark Lucky was at Twitter, he was the first journalism journalism for news person at Twitter, and he gave a presentation to the LA Times, and he said, one thing we always tell social media teams is that um, any story that, he goes, he goes, you have to understand the correlation between the tweet, and how something is engaged on the platform, and the traffic, right? You're gonna send out this high-minded nonsense and a bunch of people will retweet it because they would like to associate their brand with high-minded nonsense. You're gonna send out a tweet that's about porn or a hot middle school teacher sleeping with a young man or, mm -hmm. and zero people re will retweet it and it'll be the most clicked thing, right? And, mm -hmm. and so what's important for us to understand, we can go out and we can bust toward Citizen's Agenda. Are we willing to still write those stories when no one reads them? Are we willing to write those stories when all those people who lied to us about how they want salads really want McDonald's and are only willing to pay for McDonald's? <laughs> because that is the story of American journalism for the last 100 years. Mm -hmm. And so that, like the, that is at the heart of a lot of this tension is that we actually, like I said, we really know and understand, like actually in a very simple way, kind of some of the things we really need out of our journalism and our information ecosystem, we just can't pay for that. Mm -hmm. And we're and we're unwilling to say, we will write a, <laughs> we will put out a newspaper tomorrow that mm -hmm. history will judge as the best newspaper that should have come out that day, even if zero people picked it up. We won't do that. Mm -hmm. We, in because we run our news information system as a capitalistic enterprise. I mean, I one thing that I would I would say is that like a, a big a big challenge that I think a lot of um, young journalists are going to face is is exactly what you were you were describing this that that there is this kind of uh, it's a challenge but it's also I think an opportunity um, that a, a lot of lawmakers and particularly on on one side do not feel the need to engage at all with journalists, right? They're not gonna talk to you, they're not gonna tell you anything. Um, and recently I had a conversation with a very conservative uh, rising star um, in, in the Republican Party, and, and I asked this person, um, what, is, you know, what, what is your media diet? What do you consume? And what media platforms do you see as being important for you, right? And it was very revealing. The media diet was, Axios, Punchbowl News, 
Uh, you can guess this person is 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 uh, you know in the fed in, in the federal rather than in a state. Um, you know, uh, um, uh, semaphore. Um, you know, so so organizations that are really focused on and Politico, obviously, Politico playbook was their first thing that they of read course. in the morning, right? Um, so that's what they're paying attention to, and what their 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 sort of main media diet is, and what they care most about in terms of the inputs, and then in terms of the outputs and the audience that they're trying to reach, they said. Obviously, if you can get on main Fox News, great. If you can't get on main Fox News, get on Fox Business. If you can't get on Fox Business, here's three conservative podcasts that you could try to get on, right? And, and it was essentially sort of like descending order from there, right? And so nowhere do you, like the enterprising reporter in New Jersey, fit into that ecosystem. <laughs> so, okay, great. Here's the opportunity. Screw them, exactly. right? Like, exactly. these people... The, the horse race journalism exists because there are a bunch of cowardly politicians and pol political advisors who run around whispering into the ears of reporters who are, you know, trying desperately. I mean, to the the good ones are trying desperately to just do what they can in order to like keep feeding the beast and getting the good reporting out there. Um, and maybe this is an opportunity for us to kind of declare bankruptcy and say, like, there's actually nothing to learn there. You know, one side won't talk to us. The other side, and, and when there are people on that side that do talk to us, they want to talk off the record and they want to, yeah. you know, whisper in our ears, yeah. right? And yeah. we you need to evaluate that information very carefully. Yeah. And the other side wants to talk to us, again, off the record and whisper in our ears, and they want to talk about tactics. They want to talk about this little poll that we did or that. And maybe, maybe this is, like, the grand invitation that we've all needed to just just say, you know what, there's nothing I can learn from you. Yeah. So, so I'm hearing report what you see. I'm hearing talk to people who are actually going to be affected by something that would happen in the, in the election. Um, and I'm hearing, you know, if you're thinking about the stakes and not the odds, then you're actually not necessarily thinking about, you know, what that politician is saying, but you're thinking about what, what's going to happen in this country depending on where we come out. So we've got three sort of practical um, ideas there. Um, well, one thing, uh, Marty Barron was here uh, three weeks ago and I did a conversation with him and one thing that really struck me, and it's also in his book, um, he said that the percentage of people who are conservative or very conservative who read the Washington Post is in the single digits. And so we're talking, you know, maybe 90% are, are progressive. And the question I asked was kind of what's the point of doing, of getting into these groups where you're only writing to people who agree with you anyway, you know, what kind of influence are you having? And is there a way to speak you know, across the political spectrum a little more? I actually think some of these approaches you're taking might not scare away people who might disagree with you politically. If, if, you know, if you're actually saying, I want to report from the community on up, I want to report by, on what it matters, I want to ask people you know, what they care about, and they may not be telling me the truth, because all, everybody says they care about education, they don't necessarily vote on it, but, but at least you're trying to, to look at the things that matter to people, and maybe we would have understood what was going on in this country better in 2016, also, if, if we had done more of that. Um, the, the, the question of, um, of trying to find a way not to, to kind of speak to just one niche, and I wanna to go to Nancy on this. So you, you're saying, Net public radio isn't just a progressive audience. Yes, it's perceived to be, and Republicans don't talk to you for that reason. So why is that? I mean, is it mostly um, I mean, I, I hear from Republicans, and when I reach out to Republicans to interview them, they listen Yeah. So in New Jersey. So, um, and so I think we have more people listening uh, of a, yeah. of a, in a wider spectrum yeah. than what's anticipated. But I don't know what the data yeah. on the listeners shows i mean if the if it's in single digits for the washington post i can't imagine it's much better for public radio um yeah. but i i would like to t uh, i i i'd like to say something positive because this yes, is please. kind of depressing yes. um i was trying so, to do that too so, go so uh one of my you know i mean as a reporter you do all, you like work and work and you work hard every day and every once in a blue moon you know, you have a little success. And um, so, and this speaks to the idea of like going out and, you know, 
not just talking to people on the phone, but going out and actually meeting people where they are and attending events and, and uh, you know, leaving the house. Um, so in 2017, uh, you know, this is the first year after the Trump election. And, you know, so much of the conversation was about, you know, was either a lot of the reporting I did was either how are people talking to each other across the political divide? And we did this project called, which sounds a little similar to yours, uh, called um, Voting Block, Voting Block, Voters Block, I can't remember, but we went to one block in one town and we convened the neighbors like once a month for a year uh, and I would record the conversations I would, and I'd kind of moderate a conversation and then we'd put that on the air. And it was the idea was to try to get people of different political beliefs to actually talk to each other. Um, so that was that was OK, pretty good. But we were a little low on Republicans on that block than I initially anticipated. Um, but then so but also there was this amazing thing happening, which is that there was this kind of suburban women's movement that sprung up in 2017 of people who were really freaked out about the Trump election and were started demonstrating at their Republican congressmen's offices, trying to get them to uh, meet with them and promise some accountability that they would like push back on some of the Trump agenda. And uh, so I was going to those protests and talking to people and I was meeting people who had never hadn't been involved with politics since college, and they were, you know, in their fifties, forties, fifties, sixties. You know, these are middle-aged, middle-class suburbanites who were standing out in the rain protesting Rodney Freelingheisen, the um, Republican congressman <laughs> in District Eleven in New Jersey. So, and then the, a group formed, like the you know the first day they posted on Facebook, this group, uh, NJ Eleventh for Change. Uh, it had ended up with like a thousand people joining them. So it was kind of this real uh, interesting moment and I was trying to chronicle it. And this is, I'm sorry, I'm taking a while to get to my point, but so I go to, I decide I'm gonna go attend like their board meeting and just record it and write, you know, and just as part of my ongoing reporting about this group and this movement. And the night comes rolling around and I've already worked a full day and I'm tired and I don't want to go and I almost don't. And, uh, just, and then I force myself out of the house and drive to the house where this meeting's happening and I'm sitting there and I'm glad I'm there and I've got a shotgun mic and I'm just sitting at a dining room table in you know suburban Montclair and these folks are having their board meeting for NJ 11th for change. And one of the women says, they're talking about who's gonna show up to some event the next day. And she says, well, now, you know, I guess I can go now, it's not working. And the place goes silent. You know, there are like about eight, six or seven people around the table and everybody just stops. And I'm like thinking, what the heck's going on here? And then everybody looks at me and I think, oh, something's really going on here. And then they look back at her and finally someone speaks up and says, uh, can we say what happened? And, um, and she's like, mm, I guess. And so it turns out she'd been fired. She was a lawyer who worked for a bank and she'd been fired from her job uh, because Rodney Freelingheisen had written a letter to his buddy, the chairman of the bank, complaining that she was the ringleader of this group mm. that was mm. uh, protesting him. Um, and I'm sitting there like, Oh, and I told them, you know, I'm going to do a series of stories and it'll be down the road. It's not going to be anything anytime soon. And I'm like, I might do this tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so and I, I walk over to her and she tells me that and I get like, you know, it right straight into my mic, the whole story. Uh, and it blew up on Rodney Freelingheisen and the Freelingheisen family is like a dynasty in New Jersey. They were involved in the revolution and they've been there ever since. And this guy basically was handed the congressional seat um, and he did not survive that. So wow. there are there are successes to be had with political reporting yeah. when you get yourself out there and you just yeah. go where people are organizing and talking and uh, every once in a while, like I said, it doesn't happen yeah. often, you get a fantastic story that's just handed so, to so, you. So I'll add to my, uh, the lessons we've learned, show up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, and let, let me, uh, I that, do want to open, um, well, I was just gonna quickly yeah, say, okay, real quick. that didn't involve talking to the candidate at all. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. That yeah. literally did not involve yeah. any of the horse race nonsense. Yeah. She went and talked to real humans yeah. and then did the reporting that yeah. was the most consequential yeah. reporting in that campaign. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Fantastic. Yeah. Involved yeah. My talking to no politicians. <laughs> yeah. She All right, didn't have to yeah. up to any Republican. She uh, didn't have to. Uh, none of it. That, that's a good place to open it up to the audience because uh, we have another great panel coming. And it's probably going to start 15 minutes late for those panelists, if that's OK, because uh, we started late here. Um, do we have mics around? Yes. So we have mics. And if you just raise your hand, you'll get a mic. OK. Usually it starts slowly and then crescendos. Hi. Um you're good. I'm good. I'm good. OK. Um, a thought occurred to me listening to you all about um, horse race polling and then about the concern over reporting issues and connecting with communities. And I'm wondering if there's a way to veer the polling, uh, uh, the horse race polling into deep issue community polling. In other words, use the polling as a force not for <laughs> horse race, but actually for a deeper understanding. Because you mentioned, like, having a large sample, not just you know hundreds, but thousands. So is there a way to maybe at least push organiza media organizations to do some very deep issue polling in communities to gather that information and really inform um, you know, reporting without, without uh, necessarily having to interview a thousand people yourself, so. Yeah, that's that's part of the citizens agenda model is first you listen to people and then you have something to ask through polling to see if you've actually struck a, a nerve or whether you just talk to the wrong people. So you use polling in that um, scenario to um, prove that you heard something real. Uh, and that's, uh, it's, it's a different way of using the skills of public opinion polling because it doesn't start with the candidates and their chances of, of winning. So yeah, that's, that, that would be an important part of the model. But of course, um, as Wesley said, the horse race model comes with a business model. And so we can't expect it to disappear for that reason. But I, I think there's also like, I, I mean, just to, to link back to the, to, the, to the question about reporting, right? Like there have been some really great, like there was a story in the Washington Post about how like basically like 90, or I'm making these numbers up, but like 90% of the book bans were the result of like five people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And like just, you know, again, that's like just going and doing the actual reporting because we have this, there's this kind of broad brush that people are like, you know, parents are angry about what their children are being. And it's like, no, five people who are super invested and feel really strongly about something are essentially hacking the inattention of everyone else. And, and, and like, that's what the story is, right? Like, and, and so, so I think that like issue polling can be actually really, really helpful. Cause I think about an issue like, um, like, um, uh, transgender kids, you know, that's one of those things where, uh, you know, you, you look at, you look at the, at, at the, you know, kind of big mainstream coverage and it'll tell you this is a potent wedge issue. You know, parents are freaked out and blah, blah, blah. They're not, they don't care. Like literally has not been a factor in any big election. Like people don't show up to vote on this issue. I'm not saying it's because they don't care, but I'm not saying that it's because they're, they're like, yay, trans rights. I think it's because it's a very low salience issue, right? But if a handful of advocacy organizations are like, this matters, this matters, this matters, and they make a lot of noise, then you're like, oh, I guess we should really be covering this issue. But if you if you really like dug deep and looked at the at the issue based polling on this question, it's just not a high salience issue. And you would have known that, and you could have saved yourself a lot of trouble mm -hmm. by not like focusing on it as like a major issue yeah. in the campaign because yeah. it's just not. Yeah, Let's I fell into that trap. Go ahead. This year in the the. In the the, the election in New Jersey, we just had a state legislative election. And I basically, I looked at, at to what extent 
the parental choice issue, which every every Republican candidate had on their website, like number one issue. And I thought, oh. And then I talked to the group that was organizing that stuff, and I thought, oh, they have a lot of people out there uh, that are working on this issue. And I looked through their website, and I saw that they had, uh, I can't remember now what it was, like four, you know, 480 different candidates, school board candidates that they were uh, pushing. And I thought, wow, this could be like a sleeper issue that's going to actually, uh, you know, flip seats in the legislature. No. And a, a Rutgers poll came out the day, it didn't come out till the morning of election day that was like, people care about pocketbook issues. That's yeah. the, no and, and abortion. Those are the two issues. And the Democrats all won. Uh, you know, and I was wrong. And yeah. I got totally caught up in that. Yeah. Let, let's take two more questions and comments, and then I think we should probably go straight. We'll get to go to Gina. Um, we should go straight to the other panel because it is getting on the late side. And, yeah, and I'm uh, just yeah. starting early. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I just just to, I think just to back up I think Wes's point, which is like I recognize that trans rights. Um, sorry, very personally invested. Uh, I recognize that trans rights are not actually an election winner for people, but there is I think to, to the point about you know it isn't just about who wins. It's about the broader a conversation and the impact and the latest polling shows that the majority of Americans, a majority of Americans now believe it is morally wrong to change genders. That's up four points in two years. And that's as a result of the rhetoric, even if it doesn't win elections. So. No, I think that's a great point. And I think that not is it not, it's not just a result of the rhetoric it's the result of that rhetoric being used and being used shaping the news agenda in a way that's not actually reflective of what people's real things that they care about are, right? Because like, it's not a one-way street, right? Like, it's not as if you just say, oh, I wanna know what Americans think. We are powerful. We shape what America thinks, you know? And so if whatever you choose to emphasize becomes a thing, and, and something that you might think like, this is not a big issue, but actually it can become a big issue because it gets covered again and again. I mean, you know, everybody thought that Glenn Youngkin was like, you know, this like phenom who is gonna like remake the Republican Party. And I kept telling my podcast co-hosts, quit overlearning the lesson of, of Virginia. Quit overlearning the, it was one election right after the pandemic. And, and, and you know, it was a total flop. So, I mean, I think, I think like having some sense of like, yes, this is important. Yes, it actually affects people. But that whole news cycle was like a hype cycle that was created by journalists. You know, like it, it did not have a basis in reality. And, and we're always fighting the last war. We're always thinking this is what happened last time. So it's what's going to happen next time. And, and it's just not true. And then you, but you create this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy in exactly yes. the way that Gina described. And that's how you end up with an increasing number of people being like, well, I'm not so sure about that trans stuff. And it's like, Five minutes ago, you didn't care. Like, what? Well, what? And, and what changed, and this speaks to, we can't think of, just like we can't think of our journalistic processes as this objective neutral, a poll is not either. They weren't thinking about it till I called you at your house and asked you. Right, and so and now you do care because I've never thought before if some man should go to the bathroom with my two-year-old, like, but you called me at my house and asked me 19 questions that I've never considered before about this issue that I know literally nothing about. And now no you're way. using it as a justification to put it on the front page yeah. of the New York Times, right? right? And, and so we do, but by the, the questions we ask people yeah. set subjective agendas and polls are not immune from that. Yeah. I, I think if there's one very succinct question to come and then Quick answers, and then we'll switch to the other panel. Any one last question? You don't have to. But you can. Everyone just wants to hear you more can. from Gina. It's okay. Yeah, I understand. Going to. She's, yeah. she's, she's <laughs> doing the next panel. So. Um, okay. Well, let me thank this panel. You've been amazing, and th thank, thank you for being here.